All right, so um, I'm going to tell you a story first, and the story has to do with how we got to this point. Why are we having this event? Um, we had a 30 years of philosophy uh, celebration almost a year ago. So that's what that little uh, flyer was, 30 years of philosophy. And at that event, we, uh, we had a lot of our philosophy alum come back. These are people who have gone on to be philosophy professors, humanities teachers locally. And uh, at that event, we uh, announced that we would start a philosophy public lecture series. So this is the kickoff event for our um, public lecture series. Now, this kind of developed organically. Oh, thanks. Um, so uh, many friends have come out of the philosophy program here. And so it happened organically. Uh, I finished my um, degree, my PhD, in um, April of 2017. Right after that, people started asking me to come and give talks at other schools, ASU, Glendale Prep, that's why I invited them here, and uh, just around town. And I was always going to another school to give a talk. And uh, I thought, why am I going to other schools? Why don't I invite people to our school and we can have talks here? Because I don't like to travel. People know me. I don't like to travel. So um, this happened organically among friends. And so part of our story tonight is friendship and what friends can do and community. So um, at the 30-year anniversary, we talked about having some of those um, alum come and speak. So we started the lecture series. I'm the first to give the, the kickoff, but then we have some others coming. And there's flyers in the back. And I'll show you a website where you can see the other events that are coming up. Um, but we have uh, former PVCC students coming, and we have um, current faculty members who might give talks, and we have community members. In fact, we have a community member who got in touch with me because he wanted to give a talk somewhere, and he found my name. He was up at the Black uh, Mountain campus walking around, and he's like, who's the philosophy person? And they're like, oh, she's at the other campus. So he emailed me. He said, hi, I live in the area. I'm retired, and I want to give a talk somewhere, and I hear you have a good facility. So I met him, and we had so much in common, and he uh, is right now giving a talk in Paris at the Sorbonne, so he couldn't make it. His name is Dr. Peter Redpath, but he is going to give that talk here before, before the semester's out. I don't have a date yet, but so little PVCC is going to have a treat. Um, so that's um, part of the background for our, our lecture series. Now, um, I want to show you something else. Uh, this is, uh, I wrote a dissertation, and uh, the talks I've been giving around town have been about what I wrote about. So I guess once you, you write something, people are like, oh, can you talk about that? So this is going to be a book now, and it's, it's hopefully going to come out before the semester's out. But I wanted to show off. This is the kind of big reveal. Um, it's called Retrieving Knowledge, a Socratic Response to Skepticism. And so tonight's talk comes from chapter one in that. So I wanted to give you a little, um, I don't know, show off a little bit. This is, uh, this is the picture from last year's event. And I'm, I'm using this because I want to talk about my school. And we want to reflect a little bit on the meaning of school. Have you ever thought about that, was school? Um, well, I, was, I told my class this, I think, a week and a half ago. And I kind of got embarrassed. I said, I'm reading a book. And they're like, oh, what's the book? And then I was like, oh, it's so nerdy. Should I tell them? And it's just a book about the intellectual life. So I'm like, oh, it's about the intellectual life. And they're like, that's cool. And I was like, all right, that's cool. Let's talk about it. Um, so in that book, the author talked about school as useless. And I thought, that'll be nice. Let's tell the students school is use useless. But what did he mean by that? He didn't mean it was useless, like practically, but school originally was for the purpose of um, learning, not, not utility, like oh, I'm going to get a job, but a time in life where you learn and reflect. And Dr. Ruby's agreeing with me. So school has to do with leisure. And I thought this is, I don't know, I, I go back and forth on this leisure thing. It's from Aristotle. He thinks we need to be leisurely in order to, um, to do philosophy. I'm not sure I agree, but if you think about school 
and school and leisure. What are we doing right now? This is leisure. This is um, time outside of the classroom. This is time to reflect. Um, but schools also could be a school of thought. And that's what I kind of want to think about tonight in terms of what we're doing, what the goal here is, developing a school of thought. So tonight, be leisurely so you can think. And I want you to think about this, though, the university life, where, where you might be now or where you're going or where you've been, is it usually leisurely or is it busied? I had times. I, I remember one day I saw my English professor and he's like, oh, what are you going to do right now? I said, I'm going to go sit under a tree and read because ASU Tempe has some nice grassy areas. And he's like, oh, that's such a philosopher thing to do. <laughs> and I was like, that's right. That's why I'm going to school right now so I can be leisure and read. Um, so some of the things that we can do here to foster the intellectual life and the life of thinking is to uh, get involved with um, um, activities where we can think. And we have a philosophical society where we do that. Um, so the, philosoph the Philosophical Society is one means for cultivating the intellectual life on campus. And this is where a lot of friendships have been forged in the past. Um, friendships happen, leisurely discussions happen, heated discussions happen too, right? We've had some good ones. Um, problems are addressed. We've, we've had um, opportunities to serve, to do volunteer hours together. Um, so if you're interested, we're trying to get more students involved in the Philosophical Society. What happens every semester is they, they go off to the university. Now we have a place to send them at ASU. But uh, I need new leadership. So if you're interested in, in getting involved, we need a president, we need a vice president, we need a secretary, and we need to get some plans together. We could do a lot more than just Dr. Burton gives a talk. Um, actually, we have a, f a First Friday philosophy discussion group that's going on right now, Dr. Noshka and I, and we're getting students involved. We had about 12 show up. We, had some, we read some really difficult material together and tried to understand it, and that was very fruitful. So I want to encourage you to get involved, and uh, I guess I'm a little bit idealistic. I kind of think that the intellectual life and the academy go together. And uh, maybe I'm just old school or nerdy. I, I want to live the intellectual life. And PVCC has been the place where I've been able to do that um, since I started here. And there are pockets around that you can get involved with if you're interested in ideas. But um, I should also tell you about anti-intellectualism. I'm going to scroll up a little bit. Anti-intellectualism is a, a thing that's, I don't know, is it human or is it American? Some, some of you will know the, the book, Anti-Intellectualism anti in American Culture. Um, it's a thing. We don't, we, we don't prize just thinking for thinking's sake. Um, and I, I'd like to see that change a little bit. So uh, the, the academy has become very pragmatic. Do you know what pragmatism is? It's do what works. And what works is usually something to satisfy our desires. And that's going to be part of our talk tonight about the sophists. Um, I'm going to say that the anti-intellectualism that we, that, I don't know, that kind of percolates in our culture is, is due to a failure of philosophy. And so I think we can do better. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm suggesting we do the intellectual life and we do public philosophy. So I'm going to go down a little bit and uh, uh, talk about culture. You know what culture is? They talk about culture as a shared system of values. No, he says no. But there's something else, cultivating. It's an agricultural term, right? See, I, I get these thumbs up. Um, cultivating and uh, tilling and caring for and helping to grow. That's what we want to see in the intellectual life. Can you care for the life of your mind? Um, so think about what it takes to grow things and growing your mind. Uh, but there's also this shared system of values that cultures have. We should also talk about that. Um, they, they sometimes say, be the change you want to see. Have you heard that? Well, that's kind of what I'm doing here. I want to see the intellectual life come back. I want to see philosophy done well. And so I'm just taking little steps to do that, and I'm inviting you to join me. And uh, I think we can change the culture. It's little steps, baby steps, right? Um, I saw a, a lecture at another school. I won't name, name names. I'll let you use your imagination. It was another school way over there. Big, 
purple. And uh, the talk, I, it, was, it was interesting. This, this person was talking about um, changing the culture through uh, making culture. And it got me thinking, well, how do you make culture? What do you do? And he was suggesting you put stuff on the internet, artifacts. And I was like, um, I'm, I'm one of those old dogs that doesn't quite do the internet so well. So I made a website, and I put stuff on it. But uh, I, I kind of been reflecting on this creating culture. Change the culture by creating culture. How can we do that? So culture lives in artifacts, things we leave behind, and in institutions. So I thought, yeah, I'm involved in an institution, the academy, and artifacts. I can leave things behind, like the books I write, or the blog posts I write, or videos that we can put on the internet for other people to see and be involved with. And I think you can probably do it too, probably better than I can, create culture, right? And it comes in art and music and things we uh, hope will survive us and that are of value, that pass on value to others. So I want to think about that and how this public philosophy lecture series could be a little bit in the step in the direction of building culture, building the culture of PVCC at least. Um, we've had a rich tradition of philosophy, and I want to see that tradition um, continue. So um, that's part of the background about why we're here and why we're doing this. Um, and I've been theorizing about public philosophy for a long time. That's what the dissertation was. It was a model for public discourse. And now that I'm done you know, theorizing about it, I thought, let's put it into practice. Let's do it. I have the opportunity. I have the students. We have people. Let's do it. And I think that this uh, series will also build on the culture of some of the values of PVCC. And some of those values I've out outlined here. Critical thinking. We want to see critical thinking across the disciplines. Philosophy is by nature critical thinking. Um, collabor collaboration. You know how much collaboration it took to put this thing together? I had to collaborate with many people to make this happen. It happens naturally, though, when you have relationships, right? Um, cooperation, coordination, community, those things are uh, values that we have as a school. And learning outside the walls of the classroom. Learning doesn't only happen in the class, right? It's what you do with it outside the class. So tonight I'm going to refer to things that you might have read in class, like Plato's Apology, like Plato's Dialogues, like Aristotle's Logic, some things you might know. And it also is about lifelong learning. I know we say this, oh, PVCC is about lifelong learning. Well, it's kind of true, because I'm done with school now. And I don't have to do this, but I do this because I want to learn. Socrates said that uh, we get knowledge through conversation, the Socratic method, through the dialogue. So who am I going to dialogue with if not you? So this is lifelong learning. And uh, I want to see us put into practice the value of the cultivation of the mind for enjoyment. It's fun, let's be honest. Thinking is fun, isn't it? Sometimes, always, never. All right. And not only are we going to think for fun, we can think and solve problems. And so tonight, I'm going to present to you what I think is perhaps the biggest problem of our day, one of two. It's the biggest problem in the academy, the, the one I can handle. There's another one, and it's in the church. I'll let other people handle that one. Um, but the problem I'm going to talk about tonight is skepticism. Nobody can really know for sure. Now, you might be thinking, that's just, that's just obvious. Um, the problem in the church is called fideism. Nobody can really know for sure. You just got to believe anyway. So some of the talks in our series uh, are about that, but I'm going to let other people deal with that in a different institution. Here we talk about the academy. Um, also, write down your questions, because at the end of my talk, we'll open it up for discussion. And I'm open to any kinds of objections, pushback, counter arguments. I welcome it. This is how I learn. I pay money for it, all right? but not trolling. That's different. That's such what the sophists might do, like the bad ones. OK, now I've given some quotes here, if you're following along. I like to, 
I don't know how I got into the habit. I always make an outline for my talks. And I always like some quotes so we can chew on something. So I've picked some quotes. And these quotes are going to um, be examples of the skepticism that came earlier. So earlier skepticism. And we're going to learn from what happened before. Um, there's footnotes at the bottom. Some of these come from Aristotle. And uh, some of these come from fragments we have left from the sophists. Um, so this first one says, Gorgias declares that nothing exists. And if anything exists, it's unknowable. You should be going, what? And if it exists and is knowable, yet it cannot be indicated to others. To prove that nothing exists, he, Gorgias, collects the statements of others who, in speaking about what is, seem to assert contrary opinions. And he argues against both sides. So here's an opinion, here's a bit. OK, first, nothing exists. What? You should be going, what? And if it does, we can't know it. Nobody can really know for sure. And we can argue any side of anything, anytime. So this is a spirit of skepticism. Uh, the next three quotes are from Protagoras, a famous sophist. I've read a lot about Protagoras, and uh, I use him in my book. But he says, a human being is the measure of all things, of things that are, that they are, and of things that are not, that they are not. So this is the, the idea. A human being is the measure of all things. Humans determine the meaning of things. What do you think about that? Well, you should just mull it over. Mull it. All right, then he says, concerning the gods, I am unable to know either that they are or that they are not, or what their appearance is like. For many are the things that hinder knowledge, the obscurity of the matter and the shortness of human life. Have you heard this? Uh, he's, he's skeptical about ultimate reality. Back in the day, the gods were the explanation for all things, right? And he's saying, I don't know. I don't know if I can know about that kind of thing. And it's hard to know. Knowledge is hard. Again, skepticism. And then here's my favorite. There are two opposing arguments, or logoi, concerning everything. Now, I dug into this one in my book. And some scholars think he means there's two sides to every argument so that you could never come to an agreement. Another uh, guy suggests that there's two opposing forces to everything, and forces in opposition give rise to what appears to us. That's the metaphysical uh, interpretation of this. And that's what later philosophers are going to pick up on and say, that's probably what he meant. Um, all right, now, my dissertation was going to be about the first philosophers and then the sophists, and then Socrates' response to the sophists. And I was good. I had it all done. It was great. And then I found this next quote, and it kind of messed things up. Because then I had to do like another semester of work, and I had to read all of the works of Nietzsche. Have you ever tried that? My poor little dog, Dusty, he's my kind of therapy animal. He's like, Lady, I'll help you. I know it's hard to read Nietzsche. I'll be right here with you. So he was always with me when I was reading Nietzsche. Tough little guy. But here's the quote that kind of changed everything for me in my thinking and what gave rise to, um, I think what, what gave rise to this series. The Greek culture of the sophists had developed out of all the Greek instincts. It belongs to the culture of the Pericle Periclean age as necessarily as Plato does not. Periclean age. It has its predecessors in Heraclitus, keep these names in mind, in Democritus, and in the scientific types of the old philosophy. It finds expression in, for example, the high culture of two cities. And it has ultimately shown itself to be right. Every advance in epistemological and moral knowledge has reinstated the sophists. Our contemporary way of thinking is, to a great extent, Heraclitian, Democritian, and Protagorean. It suffices to say Protagorean because Protagoras represented a synthesis of Heraclitus and Democritus, says Nietzsche. And you're probably going, what? But when I read this, I was like, oh my goodness, this changes everything. I have to, see, I have to do so much more work now. Why? Because I had just dug into Heraclitus. He's the guy that says, all that exists is matter, and it's in flux, constant change. 
Democritus was a philosopher who said all that exists are atoms and all is matter, basically. They're both saying all is matter. And uh, Protagoras, remember the two logoi, two oppositional forces, he kind of accepts that. And he is um, going to kind of represent the position, okay, all is matter, matter's in motion, I'm, in, I'm a material being, I'm part of the material world, nothing is permanent, including me and everything I observe. We can't really know anything. There's no knower and there's no thing to be known. So how do we get on in life? Pragmatism. We just live life. And that's what I saw in Protagoras. Now, Nietzsche here is saying, that's now. And I was like, whoa, he's right. That is now. Is it? Am I right? Think about it. And then all of my philosophy classes came coming back to me. And I was like, yeah. Everything I just experienced in the university is this quote. And then I realized it's not just the past, it's the present. The present is broken. And so um, I had to do some serious thinking about how to address the skepticism of my own day. Um, some of you heard me say, this is, this is my hill now, I'm, I'm going to die on it. Yeah. Tilting at windmills, right? Okay, so um, I want us to think about this. What is philosophy? Some of you are in 101 right now or have taken it. Um, what is philosophy? I've just given a little synopsis here. So philosophy is the foundational discipline in the academy. It's the first, it's the first discipline. Plato starts the academy. Um, but it's foundational in terms of the questions it asks, the most basic questions. Um, how do I know stuff? What is real? What is a human being? What is the good life? So it's foundational. And if that foundation is uh, messed up, I think the rest is going to be messed up. The academy teaches all of the others in, in society, everyone who goes to the university. So if, the, if philosophy is the foundational discipline is messed up, then maybe they're corrupting the other disciplines. But I could be wrong. I, I, I welcome pushback. Uh, philosophy is the love of wisdom. Remember Socrates? Remember his pursuit of wi wisdom? It's the critical use of reason. Using reason to, to critically examine uh, assumptions and biases. And philosophy is self-examination. Remember what Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living? So it's the examined life. And philosophy is a system. It has to do with a world and life view. I talk to my students about your house that... You have a foundation. You have ground, and your ground is your epistemology. It's what sets the tone for the rest of the house. Then you have your foundation, and that's your metaphysics. And then the rest of the house is your, your, uh, your ethics, how you live life, what you practice. So I put theory and practice. It's like your philosophy of life and how you live it out, what you do. So that's a synopsis of philosophy. But what does philosophy assume? Now, this is, this is the kicker. Philosophy as a discipline assumes knowledge is possible. Socrates would not have gone to his death if he didn't think you could know stuff. He would have been like, hmm, you know what? I think I'll just stop doing philosophy. He believed you could know things, not just anything. You could know the basic things about um, what, is, what is real? What is a human? What is a good life? This is what he was pursuing, right? I could be wrong, though. Don't just believe it because I said so. Go read. All right, so um, I want to tell you a little bit of the background of the first philosophers, because Socrates isn't the first philosopher, although some people like to think he is. Before Socrates, there were uh, philosophers who were um, breaking from the tradition of the Greek gods, the gods of Homer's epics. And they wanted to know by observing nature they were like, why are we you know, telling these stories about the gods and the gods are always intervening in human affairs and starting wars. These gods don't even seem moral. Why can't we just observe nature and, and try to understand what it is? So the first philosophers were material monists. Um, their method, here I'm gonna highlight this part. Well, maybe I can't, here we go. I'm right here. So they, they were empiricists. You know what an empiricist is? An, an empiricist? All of our knowledge is through the senses. 
seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And um, that kind of always leads to skepticism. I'm, I'm willing to say this. Because uh, what I sense could change. What I sense and what you sense could be different. So we talk about having my perspective. Um, uh, sensations are subjective, they're not objective. So this kind of leads to skepticism naturally. Um, but then they added this materialism. Uh, materialism is the idea that all that exists is the material or nature. They assume nature is all there is. Now they paired those two. It's also kind of associated with nominalism. Every particular thing is unique and has a name. There are no universals. Um, this is when you combine empiricism and materialism, it leads to skepticism. Like I said earlier, if everything is matter in motion and you're part of the material world and you're matter in motion, then what is permanent that knows anything? What's the knower? It's just a bundle of atoms. Um, so they, they did bottom out in skepticism. They had other problems too. Um, they, they, they went back and forth. If all is matter and matter is in motion, then all is flux and there is no permanence. But there's another philosopher named um, Parmenides who said, no, wait a minute. If all is matter and all is one, then there is no such thing as motion because there's just one thing. And motion is just an illusion. So they go back and forth. All is one, all is many, all is permanence, all is change. Ah, oh, you really can't know. It took about 240 years, but philosophy almost died at that point. It was like bottoming out. And people are like, come on. And they're writing uh, comedies about the philosophers. They read a comedy about Socrates, portrayed him as having his head up in the clouds and worthless, right? Um, and so this is where the sophists come in. And I'm going to say sophistry versus the sophists. Sophistry is sort of uh, this skepticism taken to an extreme and uh, using, using um, the power of language to get what you want, or what you, what you think you want. Um, and then there's a relativism. If you remember Protagoras saying man is the measure, um, this is a kind of, well, a scholars debate, is this uh, truth is relative, or ethics are relative, or, bo or both are relative? So we sometimes say, well, that's my truth, or that's my perspective, or it's true for me. So maybe Protagoras, when he says man is the measure, he means that where we are the measure of truth, but it also could be ethical standards, like um, what's good for me is good for me, what's good for you is good for you, but we don't share the good. Um, so at the end of this is the question, is objective knowledge possible? Is this where philosophy ends? Now the first philosophers did think you could know. They weren't like starting off as skeptics. It's not like they went, oh, we can't really know anything, so let's go explore the physical world. They, they thought they could know. And it turns out the methods they employed didn't deliver what they were looking for. So in my book, I call this the search for the logos. The philosophers were looking for um, the explanation for the fit between um, this rational mind we find ourselves with and this orderly world. And they're asking, what is the source of that? Why is it that my mind fits the world and they, they called it this Logos. And uh, even Heraclitus talked about the Logos. He said, the Logos is all around us, but nobody sees it. I think he was wanting to be involved in the intellectual life too, and he probably talked to people who are like, few philosophers. Um, so they're looking for the Logos. Um, now, I want to talk about the rise of the Sophists and um, what's happening some of this is political, um, cultural changes, but the part I want to focus on is the, the skepticism. Um, now, I did, okay, I'm aware that most of my knowledge of the sophist is from Plato and Aristotle and Diogenes, and all of them could be biased. They, they, they have a beef with the sophist. So I read a book over the weekend, borrowed by one of my colleagues, because I heard ASU is like pro-sophist. There's some teachers over there like, the sophists are the guys. We love them. So I was like, tell me more. I need to know about this. So I read a book over the weekend, and I saw their point. Yeah, the sophists have done um, some good things for, for Western civilization. And so I want to recognize that without you know, knocking them um, in a biased way. But first, I'm going to give the bad side of the sophists. 
bad side first, Gorgias. Um, what is this nothing exists stuff? Um, nothing exists, but what is happening right now? What is going on? I, I analyzed this, and I think what he was doing, it's interesting, he saw the first philosopher saying, um, everything that exists is one, and it's matter, or all is eternal. I think Gorgias may be saying nothing is eternal. He's just giving the contrary. If you can argue two sides of every argument, then all is eternal is countered by nothing is eternal, or all exists, nothing exists. He's giving a counter, but that's not really, if you take logic, that's not a contradiction, it's a contrary. Those aren't the only options, but it hadn't occurred to them yet. Um, so maybe he's saying, you philosophers are going the wrong way with this all is, all is eternal. Um, but what he does, does bring skepticism, and Aristotle writes a lot about Gorgias and his skepticism. You can read more about it in my book if you want to. Uh, Thrasymachus, do you know who Thr Thrasymachus is, anybody? Anybody read The Republic of Plato? He's the guy at the beginning who, who um, Socrates is arguing with about, um, I guess, I don't know, the good life and, and who should rule and what is justice. And uh, he comes up with this idea that justice is what the, what the powerful determine. Have you ever heard that? Justice is what those in power determine, um, or might makes right. Um, he, he kind of talks about the tyrant, and the tyrant gets into power and determines the laws, and all of us are, you know, oppressed by the laws of the tyrant. This kind of sounds familiar, though, right? And guess who else is going to talk about that? Nietzsche, the will to power, that all we have are these power struggles. So Thrasymachus represents that position. I don't know, do you see how that could lead to cynicism? If all, if all that is, all, all that um, laws are about is power struggles, then phew, what is justice? It's just what the powerful say. Um, but I don't think we have to get stuck there. I just want to give you a heads up. I gave a talk at ASU West last year uh, about how um, social justice and Nietzsche can't, can't go together. Can't have your social justice and Nietzsche too. So we need to, social justice requires, I think, an objective standard for justice. And if we're going to have an objective standard for justice, it can't be based on what the powerful say because that's the very opposite of social justice, right? Okay, so Protagoras is the third um, sophist that, all three of these are, are characters in dialogues that Socrates is, is engaged with. Plato's dialogues, there's about 33 of them. Plato was Socrates' student. And he wrote down these dialogues. Now, part of them are, I mean, they're probably fiction. He was a playwright. He was a, a playwright before he was a philosopher. So he puts them in dramatic form. And that's what makes them so exciting. But it's Socrates versus these guys in a discussion. Socrates doesn't always win, but he usually looks better. Um, so he argues with Protagoras. And uh, he also, uh, the, the dialogue that I looked at, for my, my dissertation is called The Theotetus. I spent so much time with this dialogue, I think I'm married to it. <laughs> Sorry, David. I am. I feel like this is my dialogue, and this is like, you know, everyone has like a life saying. This is like my life dialogue. Um, it's become who I am now, um, because I had to look at it in the original Greek, too, and it was, it was good. But Protagoras is a, is a character in that story, but he doesn't actually show up. He has a student representing his position. And Socrates is arguing with the student. Um, and in that dialogue, the, the Socrates is asking, what is knowledge? So this is the what is knowledge dialogue. He says, what is knowledge? And the student, who's a mathematician, my theory is that Socrates is testing this guy out to see if he has potential as a philosopher, or is he just going to be a math guy? Not that there's anything wrong with that. So he says, so uh, Theotetus, what is knowledge? And he says, oh, knowledge is perception. And he's like, that's nice. What do you mean by perception? And it's unclear. Is it perception like my senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching? Or is it perception like my interpretation? So they play it out. They work it out. And it turns out neither of those quite works. But he's playing with this man as the measure. Um, and uh, it, I, I'm just going to say that dialogue is addressed to the assumptions of the sophists that I have just mentioned. Um, so the sophists 
uh, are trying to get on with life. They are teachers, paid teachers, that come to Athens from other city-states. They're not native to Athens. This is part of the political problem. And Athens is a democracy. And so in a democracy, you, uh, when you go to the law courts, you need to be able to argue your position. So the sophists were teaching uh, young men how to be statesmen. That's their claim, right? And some of the dialogues, what do you teach them? Oh, we teach them virtue. Oh, that's interesting. What is virtue? It turns out they don't really know. And so Socrates is like, you're not teaching them anything. You don't teach these people any content and you charge a lot of money. Um, but I do think they might have been teaching something. So I'm going to give the plus side to the sophists. Um, so here's the benefits of the sophists. And I, and I did work hard on this because I'm, I'm reading these biased guys. So this is probably why some people at ASU are fans of the sophists, because they were humanists. They put the emphasis on the human. So man is the measure. Humans are important. And uh, humans um, should develop their whole potential. I think that's kind of a good thing, don't you? That's, that's a worthy, worthy thing to pursue. But what about when the human is all that is in terms of determining value? This is where it could become a problem. If we say humans are the determiners of value, then what happens when you have one human who determines this value and another human who determines this value? Then you have a clash of values again, and it's a power struggle. So if we only go with humanism and nothing transcending the humans, this could be a problem. And Socrates is going to see that. Um, they em emphasize subjectivity. So the, uh, the first philosophers were like looking for this objective truth, objective truth, what is true, what is true. And maybe they neglected subjectivity, the human subject and our experiences, lived experiences. So the sophists did emphasize that. And I think we still value that, right? But what if all is subjective? All is subjectivity. That again could become a problem. There's nothing beyond my subjective experience. Then, and then we're just telling stories to each other, right? There's nothing we share in terms of knowledge. Um, they were great communicators. And they developed rhetoric, um, oration, speaking skills, public speaking skills. They wanted to uh, see the beauty in language. I think this is important, right? Um, I think it's important that we know how to speak well and communicate our ideas clearly with each other. And if you can do it in a way that is, reaches a person where they're at, that's important, right? So you have to know your audience. So rhetoric is, uh, probably Protagoras is the grandfather of rhetoric. And Aristotle takes it and develops it. So they don't reject this. They don't say rhetoric, that's so sophist. <laughs> they take it and they develop it. Um, so the students of Socrates are not going to neglect the, um, some of the work of the uh, sophists. And uh, I read a book that said possibly Protagoras is the father, grandfather of formal logic. Um, he saw that language is a carrier of ideas and he was developing like A and non-A before Aristotle did. So he was almost a, a, a precursor of the laws of thought. So we can say thank you, sophists, and we can say thank you uh, for your contribution to philosophy, um, even though they're not doing philosophy. Now, Socrates encounters these guys. Um, I forgot to say, part of the problem with the sophists in Athens was they were coming in, teaching young people, charging money, and uh, it seemed as though what they were teaching was undermining the traditional values of Athens particularly their religion. And so some of the parents didn't like the sophists. And Socrates gets lumped in with the sophists in the uh, apology, if you remember that. Um, they, they accuse him of being a sophist um, because he's corrupting the youth and he's teaching strange gods. That's what the sophists do. You must be one of them. And the funny part is the accusation comes from some sophists. So I don't know what's going on there. Actually, I'll think about that some more. All right, so here's, let's talk about Socrates and the sophists now. That's our talk, right? Um, Socrates spends about 50 years doing philosophy in the public realm. And Athens, I don't know if it's very large, but he's going around talking to people who appear to have knowledge or wisdom. He goes to the politicians and he asks them about justice. He goes to the poets and asks them about beauty goes to the craftsmen and say, what do you guys know? 
He's looking for knowledge. These people appear to be wise, and he, and he wants to know if they have knowledge. So his pursuit is for knowledge, and these people appear to have knowledge, but I don't know if you read the Apology, you find out they didn't really know. Um, he encounters their empiricism and skepticism, not just theirs, but the first philosophers. And there's a really interesting story he tells. Um, let me think about where it is. Ooh, I think it's in the Phaedo. He tells about how he started off as a natural philosopher. This is his first path he took, which means he was doing philosophy in the old way. Empiricism and materialism, all of our knowledge is through the senses, and all that we could know is the material world. But he realized that that way wasn't going to deliver knowledge, so he went on a second journey, he says, and this second journey was the journey of the dialogue. And it seems like he changed courses, he changed course, and is looking for knowledge through a different method. So he creates this, I don't know if he creates it, at least in the dialogues, he looks like he does, creates this method for pursuing knowledge through discussion. And this is where he's going to say community is necessary to gain knowledge. You have to have a conversation partner. He has to have the sophists. I don't think Socrates could be Socrates without the sophists. I'll let you think about that though. Could he have just like gone in his little tower, ivory tower, and thought up all the things he thought up? And maybe you think he didn't think anything up. Well, he claimed he doesn't have any wisdom. Yeah, I don't know if I believe him. We'll see. All right, so he argues against empiricism <coughs> and skepticism. In the, in the Theotetus, in the dialogue, the Theotetus, he, uh, he does seem to know some stuff or it claims, okay, he appears to know some stuff. For example, he thinks knowledge is possible. He's not an empiricist. He's going to be considered a rationalist later, that we know things through reason. Now, that rationalism is going to go south, too. I'm going to just be honest. The empiricists and the rationalists both take philosophy down some bad roads. Um, I don't know that we have to be rationalists or empiricists. Um, he, he thinks knowledge is possible in contrast to the sophists and the first philosophers. He also thinks that matter is not the only thing that exists. This is kind of, I think it's kind of radical what he does here. He says there are universals and part of the universal thing is that we have a soul and our soul is the permanent part of us. Now he's going to take it to the extreme. It's the permanent part of you like eternally. Before you lived in this body, your soul exists and after this body, your soul is going to continue kind of reincarnation. I don't know if we have to go that way, but he did introduce the soul as the, um, the rational part of us that um, is the part of us that persists through time. And that's what was missing in these philosophers. They're like, how can I be part of the material world, but also be a thinking thing? How does that work? And he introduces universals in nature out there in the world. Uh, this is also something I'm not sure we have to accept, but he talks about the forms. Um, there are particulars we observe, but when we uh, grasp what it is, we're kind of getting to its essential nature. This also has been critiqued historically. I just came up with a, a paper topic. I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, it's going to be called Logos versus Forms, because the first philosophers are looking for the Logos. They're not looking for the Forms. So I want to argue that there's, there's a better, better way to do this, getting your universals. Um, Okay, he argues against this relativism. This is a big part of, of Socrates' journey. He's looking for the good life. What is the good? And he thinks that there's this good that is common to all humans. It's not like the good is man as the measure. No, there's a good for humans. Um, and there's a common good for the Republic. And he thought he was seeking that common good for Athens um, when he was doing philosophy. He, he was doing this for them. Although I think he was probably doing it because it was how you get knowledge too. And maybe knowledge is connected to the good for humans. I'll just put that out there. Um, and so with Socrates and some of these ideas and others that you can read about in the dialogues, I encourage you to read them for yourself. Um, there's a revival of philosophy as the pursuit of knowledge. It could have died with the, with the first philosophers. Uh, maybe the sophists are like, you know what? We could just get on with life. We don't have to do philosophy. We can just like make it work. But Socrates saw the danger in that. The danger for the Republic, I think, the common good. And so there's a revival. Um, 
So one of the things that comes up is what's, what distinguishes philosophers from poets and craftsmen and politicians? It's the search for the logos. And I feel like that's the thing that's been lost in philosophy today. We've lost the search for the logos. And what is this logos? It's the, the, uh, the order of being that fits our mind. How can our mind know what is? It's about ultimate reality. We don't talk about ultimate reality or metaphysics. We don't do metaphysics. That's so like pre-Nietzsche. Everybody knows we're post-metaphysics. I know, right? We're not, we're not. We're, we're dishonest about it. We do metaphysics, but we don't name it metaphysics. We just call it fact, science. All right, um, so the thing that distinguishes philosophers, now this is my claim. I'm claiming this, I could be wrong, and I, I welcome pushback. The thing that distinguishes philosophers from the others in, in uh, the dialogues is the search for the logos. And I'm gonna suggest that's true still. And this may be why the, the academy is broken. Now, so let's talk about what happens after Socrates dies. Why does philosophy survive? Was it just that, oh, people thought Socrates was so brilliant, we're just gonna like preserve his stuff. He never wrote anything. He just walked around and he didn't claim to be a teacher. He's just talking to people, but he had students. And I imagine, and, and Dr. Ruby and I were talking about this, I imagine he had friends. I imagine he had a community that was interested. He had students that were like, you know what? We're gonna capture all of this. And they wrote it down. It's Plato wrote it down. And Plato started a school. So we're back to our topic, the beginning. Plato started the academy. And uh, this was a place where they could do the intellectual life. This is how the university starts. Aristotle was the student of Plato and he starts the Lyceum, another school. So here's also where we have schools of thought, but they were also groups of people developing them, starting institutions, forming institutions. And uh, I, I've been reflecting on this. Why did it succeed? Why do we say Plato and Aristotle are the foundations of Western philosophy, Western civilization? Two guys, can't just be two guys. Two guys with great ideas? I don't think so. I think there are probably others unmentioned friends, unmentioned community members, students. The students wrote down Aristotle's notes. They thought, this, this is good stuff, let's preserve it. So they made artifacts and they made culture. And we still go back to them as the, the heart of philosophy, even if we reject them. So Nietzsche's gonna be like, yeah, everything was great until Plato and Aristotle, they messed everything up, we gotta fix it. And Nietzsche thought he was the guy that would fix philosophy. So he rejected everything, but you know what? He had to pay attention to them. And you know what? The church had to pay attention to them when Christianity began. First challenge was Judaism. Hmm, how do Christians relate to Judaism? Second challenge, hmm, how do Christians relate to Greek culture, especially Plato and Aristotle? And so the next phase of history and philosophy, if you've seen the video, is, I made a video for my students on the history of philosophy. Um, the Christians sometimes adopt Plato, sometimes adopt Aristotle. We're still doing it. So I, I kind of suggest in, a, in one of my talks at another place that let's don't do that. It's probably a bad idea. Um, but what is required for building institutions? This is going to come back to us now, okay? Um, friendship, I think. Friendship is required. What is friendship? Do you have friends? Would you know it if you did? You talk to your friends about the good life. Yeah, snicker, snicker, snicker. Do you share your deepest concerns with them? All right, so I'm gonna suggest friendship is required for building institutions and friendship is required for doing philosophy. You need a community of people that are like-minded. And that was, that's why I wanted to do this so that we can um, I know that I have students here and there, and you know what happens? They text me late at night, former students, recently, big, long text. I'm like, this is something you talk about. You don't text that kind of deep stuff. <laughs> I'm serious, don't text me late at night, some deep philosophical thing. I don't even know how to answer that. I'll just say, you know what, why don't we meet together? But then you know what, I'm meeting with 25 people at this new Starbucks over here. No. <laughs> so I said, you know what, let's just do this together. 
and we can help each other answer the questions. I don't have to answer everything. You got each other. All right, so the institution of the, the academy is, is currently crumbling. I don't know if you, you know this, but um, some people are going around saying philosophy is dead. I'll name a few. Richard Rorty, who is a kind of a philosopher, he said philosophy is dead. It's good for therapy right now. And uh, um, Stephen Hawking wrote a book, The Grand Design. He begins the book by saying philosophy is dead. And he basically says us, us scientists need to bring everyone to enlightenment now. And then he writes a philosophy book. <laughs> no, it really is a philosophy book. Check it out. Um, Let's just name it what it is. Just say, hey, we think we can do philosophy better than you guys. That would make it more fun, I think. Um, the academy is seen as a problem. How about this? College students who are about to go to the university from, you know, little PBCC. Do your parents get nervous about sending you to the university? Are they going to get a job? What are they studying? Yeah, I, w I won't say study philosophy. I know what your parents are going to say. Yeah, I, you know what? I didn't listen. I didn't listen at all. They told me. I forgot to tell you about Dr. Anderson. I'll tell you about him in a minute. He and I were, were, were in the BA. We went to PVCC together. Then we were in the BA program together. And we won't, both went to one of our professor's office to see if we could get a letter of recommendation for the uh, MA program over at ASU Tempe. And the guy just said, no, you don't want to major in philosophy. We're like, yeah, we do. And he's like, mm-mm, you'll never get jobs. And uh, I don't know if it's my generation, but maybe don't tell me I'm not going to get a job because I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> or I don't know, maybe that's proud. Maybe it's just grace. I don't know, but we both got jobs. It took a lot of work, and we hustled a lot. Um, yeah, I had to teach high school. <laughs> uh, but the academy is seen as a problem, and when the, when the academy... Uh, is broken, <coughs> culture suffers. I, I think this is true. Now, you, you don't have to agree with me, but I think it's true. When the academy suffers, the culture suffers. Just look around. Just look at what's happening. Um, and I think the academy is broken because philosophy is not being done. <gasps> but they have a philosophy department over there. I know I spent many, many, many years. I spent 25 years in school. Isn't that crazy? I live in the academy. I love the academy. And it's broken. I can attest to it. Um, and it's because philosophy is not being done. There's no search for the logos. What the first philosophers were doing, what Socrates was doing, we, we aren't doing that. And there's a reason why, historically. And that's my next talk. I should put in a shameless plug, right? <laughs> my next talk, you have to travel for this one, uh, to ASU West, is going to be the story of uh, philosophy from Nietzsche, and he dies in 1900, to now. And this is kind of my therapy. Like, what did I just go through in school? OK, so the academy is being run by the sophists, in my view. I think this is kind of controversial to say. You can, you can push back, but I think it is. Uh, the poets, the craftsmen, the politicians, or the humanities, the scientists, the politicians, the social scientists. But where are the philosophers? Where is any prom How many of you know a contemporary prominent philosopher that is making a difference in the world right now? <laughs> Total eye roll. All right, well, that's, that says something. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, why? Because these ideas are, are, are dominant in the academy. Again, material monism, materialism, empiricism, skepticism, Relativism and institutional pragmatism. They're back. But guess what? Um, we learned, I learned from Socrates, that we don't have to be stuck with that. We can know things. And so I use Socrates' arguments against our contemporary <coughs> um, dominant philosophy. I went back, and that's what I'm calling retrieval philosophy. Um, a friend of mine said this the other day. I liked it, so I stole it. We're forward looking because we're backward thinking. I don't mean like backwards, like, but we look back in order to look forward. And that's why I was like, hey, that's what I'm doing. That's retrieval philosophy. I want to retrieve what was good in the past in the history of philosophy and apply it to contemporary problems. 
Um, and I want us to remember Socrates in the pursuit of knowledge. I know so many of you have been told you can't know anything for sure. I was told this. You can't really know. I told my students about the skepticism class I took. I paid money for this. I, I started the first day of class. Uh, this professor comes in and he goes, for all you know, you may be a brain in a vat being stimulated by an evil scientist to have this experience you're having right now. You don't know anything. And we all looked at each other. Do we take notes on this? <laughs> no, right? Seriously, the whole class was, you don't know anything. And, and he challenged us, can you come up with an argument that you're not a brain in a vat? So I tried. I wrote a paper on it. And I had like three really hardcore arguments. And he wrote, B. Nice argument, too bad it doesn't work. No explanation, I was terrified of this guy. <laughs> He's at U of A now, and I think about going down there and asking him, why didn't the argument work? But um, that's what I paid money for. That was my education. You don't know anything. You can't know anything. And we're paying, I can see why parents might be upset. You're, you're, you're telling my child you can't know anything and they're paying you money for that? Maybe we should just, you know, bypass this school thing. I, I don't think so. I think let's go back, okay? Let's be the gadfly to the academy. Remember Socrates is the gadfly to Athens. He imagines Athens like a big, comfortable, fat horse, and this is a fly that's biting it, getting it to move. Get out of your comfort zone because you're in going into danger. And they were. Athens was on the decline. And so I think we should be the gadfly to the academy because we love the, I love the academy. And we should rebuild institution building and we'll do it small we'll take small steps we'll have talks we'll come together we'll think together we'll build a community together we'll talk about hard readings together and uh, we'll disagree in a civil way and we'll be a model for others and then maybe other people will like hey I like what PVCC is doing we should do that at our school and they'll model us how about that will be a, a good example to others where friendship and community are, are building and growing so that's the end of my talk, but I want to give you some action items before you go, because I learned about action items from my students. I used to put homework on the board, and then uh, somehow it came up. We should call it action items instead of homework. It sounds like official. So here are your action items. You should attend the PVCC public lecture series. I'm going to show you a website I made now. Be forgiving. Uh, I am an old dog learning new tricks. I like to think of myself as a brick allure. This is, Nashka will know this, right? I'm a brick allure. I use what's at hand to put things together. I don't know what I'm doing, but I think I know how to do this. I know how to put it together. So everyone was saying, hey, can you advertise to your students our talk over here at ASU or our talk over here at GCU? So I had all these flyers and I'm pinning them on the walls in my classroom and I'm telling the students, I think there's a talk coming up. You should check the paper. And I thought, you know what? I could just put all this on a website. So I made a little website here. It's called public, uh, publicphilosophy.com, I think. Yeah, <coughs> so I made this for you. And uh, you can see there's different flyers. But down here, maybe, I'm going to show you our next talk. It is this one, Why Study the Humanities. And this one is, there's a flyer back there if you want a paper copy. This one is from, uh, by PVCC uh, alumni, Dr. Owen Anderson, that I was just telling you about. He's, he's one of my best friends. We went to school together. We've done this together. And he's at ASU West now. And he's a full professor now. He just got that this year. So that's a lot of work. I don't know if you know what it takes to be full professor. But he, he's the uh, full professor now. And he's going to talk about why study the humanities. Apparently, he's on some big thing for ASU. Uh, faculty senate something or other and wrote this big thing trying to convince Crow f that the humanities are still important so Michael Crow the president of, of um, ASU so he wants to give some of that talk here that's going to be the next one you think oh that's so boring humanities no it's not it's exciting you should come and uh, <laughs> that is uh, October 16th and then another PVCC uh, alumni uh, he's a new professor, just starting off. I think he's in his second year at Gateway Community College, full-time full philosophy teacher there, um, Greg Goodrich. And he's going to talk about science, religion, and Jordan Peterson. I don't know. Do you know who Jordan Peterson is? I just found out about Jordan Peterson from my students recently, and apparently he's a big hit on the Internet. But uh, Greg Goodrich has been following Jordan Peterson and is going to offer a little critique. 
But notice, science and religion, ooh, how do those fit together? Come on, this could be a controversial one. You should come out to it. And then uh, I, I mentioned Peter Redpath. He's going to also be uh, talking. Once I have his flyer, I'll put it on this site. But I also want to plug a couple other things. First, Friday Philosophy. Our next meeting is October 5th. And we're talking about a letter on humanism by Heidegger. And you can talk to me or Dr. Noshka after to find out how to be involved in that. And, and it's open to members in the community. You don't have to just be a PVCC student. Um, I want to plug a couple other things really quickly, and that's the ASU Philosophy Out West series. I kind of borrowed from them, OK? I, I was invited there twice, and I thought, yeah, I like what you guys are doing. I'm going to borrow that. And so I modeled ours on theirs. They, they give 10 a semester, 10 talks. Um, I'm not sure this is the whole thing, but uh, I'm talking there about post-Nietzschean nihilism or nihilism. So it sounds kind of dark, doesn't it? This is a dark talk. You should come. It's Tuesday, October 9th. That's coming up. I got to prepare for that one. And lastly, this is a big deal, big, big deal. This God and truth is their meaning in the world is a tradition that Glendale Community College has had. I guess this is their sixth year. And they've asked me to come in the past, but it's about things I don't know anything about. So I've been telling them that I, I don't. I don't know that topic. And so this year, it was about something I know a lot about. Um, so this one's about uh, religion or secular humanism. That is the question. And we have five panelists, um, me, Dr. Anderson, uh, Peter Lupu, from, he's philosophy faculty at uh, Glendale Community College, uh, Dr. Mike Valley from Scottsdale Community College, and then a member of the community who's into arguing and discussing, and they represent different positions on this topic. Is there meaning in the, in the world? You should come to that one because I guess they have like 300 people show up to these events, which makes me a little nervous. Maybe they're not going to be as friendly as you, but I get to start it off. I get to set the tone. So if you're interested, uh, you can go to this website, publicphilosophy.com. Uh, here's the ASU Philosophy Club flyer. Boom, and I have a, a I guess it's a colleague's daughter um, who started this uh, Dead Theologian Society at GCU, if you go there and you wanna talk about theology. And then uh, Dr. Gingadine was, was my professor here and he's giving a talk at GCU next week, I think. So if you want to come to that, that's also listed here. So that's, uh, that's the, the website. Let's see if we can wrap this up. Um, give me just a second to get back to the bottom. I got to keep myself on track with this outline. <coughs> OK, so you can attend the public lecture series. And you can attend uh, other talks around town. You can talk to your friends. You know, you don't have to come to talks to do philosophy. You can just, in the KSC building where you eat lunch, talk to your friends. Walk in in the hallways, talk to your friends. Hey, we learned this in class today, what do you think? Um, be leisurely, turn off your devices. I, when I started, we didn't have devices. That's probably why I went and sat under a tree. I didn't have anything else to do between classes. I got a book, I'm gonna go read, try it. it might get addictive. And then seek the good, that's my advice. Okay, I'll pause here and see if you have questions, and I hope you do because um, I said a lot of stuff, and some of it may be controversial, and I'd like to hear alternative views and um, maybe just have some questions. Uh, here's how we could do the questions. Maybe you can just stand up and project your voice from where you are. Don't be shy. We're all friends here. Come on. I just gave a whole talk about friends. It takes courage. You've got to be bold. I'm up here. I never took public speaking, and my chair of my division who's the communications person is here so come on that's got to be a little bit courageous right 